Okay. I think we may be live on YouTube and on Zoom. So um, we're doing pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Raleigh. I'm the Department Head of Landscape Architecture and Regional and Community Planning. And I'd like to welcome you to our first ECDAL lecture of 2021. We're experiencing rolling blackouts right now, and um, I'm so impressed. We're at almost 100 people on screen, on Zoom at least right now. So um, that tells me that you're, you must be someplace safe and warm and um, watching on a device with a full charge. We've got a team of people working on this lecture, and we've got backup plans if any of our connections fail. So if we hit a glitch, hang on. Um, we hope that we'll be able to keep things going. And we're recording, so you can watch this later and um, let those who aren't able to be here know that. The Oscar S. Ekdahl Distinguished Lecture Series in the College of Architecture, Planning and Design honors Oscar Ekdahl, who received his Bachelor of, Lands of Architecture, <laughs> I wish it was Landscape Architecture, <laughs> degree from Kansas State University in 1933. Mr. Ekdahl was a founding partner in Ekdahl Davis DePew Pearson Architects in Topeka. We always share this information at the beginning of each Ekdahl lecture to honor the person whose legacy has had such a deep and long lasting impact on students, faculty, and professionals. The Ekdahl lectures are the finest individuals in the design and planning disciplines. And most importantly, these innovative and inspiring people help students visualize the work of each of our disciplines and inspire each of us to consider the impact that our own work might have. City planners shape the places and systems that determine the quality of people's lives today and decades into the future. We advocate for thoughtful development and redevelopment that optimizes resources, and we craft policies and plans that foster connection, inclusivity, equity, and sustainability. We shape the world. Many planners pick a path and make their impact through a career in a public agency or with a private practice or through nonprofit work. Our speaker today, Gia Biaggi, has checked all of those boxes in her career since graduating with a Master's of Urban Planning and Policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I get the sense that she's just getting warmed up on the impact that she's going to have. Gia Biaggi is currently the Commissioner of Transportation for the City of Chicago. Her department is responsible for Chicago's roadways, bridges, sidewalks, bike lanes, the citywide bike share system, all of the infrastructure and systems that provide transportation to the people of Chicago and connect people and places. She's implementing policies prior that prioritize equity and focus on climate adaptation poverty alleviation, safety, and new mobility. Gia also served as the city, of, the city of Chicago as chief of staff, and before that, the director of strategy and policy for the park district. That's an agency with 3,000 employees, a $48 million operating budget, and over $2 billion in assets. And in between those two public agencies, she was a principal with Studio Gang, leading their urbanism and civic impact practice, where she led design teams, facilitated stakeholder engagement with an urban design approach that focused on equity and positive change in cities. She was working with community-based organizations, cultural institutions, government, developers, and many other public and private groups and individuals. And checking that last box in the possible career paths of a planner, Gia has been engaged in a great deal of nonprofit work. She has led and is serving on the boards of NeighborSpace, City Parks Alliance, and the Golden Institute. All of this tells you a lot about her pr professional perspectives and her values. But before we welcome her, I just wanna tell you one more thing about her. When Gia was contacted about her Ekdahl speaker's fee, she let us know that she wants to give it back to the college so that it can be awarded as a scholarship to an RCP student of color 
So she is truly shaping places and lives. Gia is going to talk for about 45 minutes, sharing her work and her vision. And at the end of her lecture, Professor LaBarbara Wigfall will join Gia to pose some questions and serve as moderator for discussion. So we were hoping that we'd be doing this on YouTube. If you are able to be on YouTube, log in so you can contribute to the discussion. And we'll also try to follow the chat on Zoom um, so submit your questions and your discussion topics. Please join me in welcoming Gia Biaggi to AP Design in Kansas State. We are so happy and honored to have you with us as an Ektal lecture, Gia. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. It, it's my honor to participate in this important lecture series. And I'm, I was delighted to be invited here. Um, so you heard a little bit about my background, maybe too much about my background uh, in the introduction, and, and thank you uh, for that generous description. And you know, I think you can see I've worn a lot of hats, uh, public, private, and nonprofit, um, and, and that's what planners do, right? We toggle back and forth across organizations and systems and places. Um, and you know, in thinking about this lecture, I was reflecting on that experience and contemplating, you know, what are some of the themes that thread through my set of experiences that um, really stick out to me? And they're pretty obvious, I think, you know, important themes like urbanism and public space, movement, friction, equity, uh, civic impact. And all of those themes, you know, no matter where I've been, have been part touchstones for me in terms of thinking about the work that we're doing. But in particular, I feel like I've been chasing down a couple of key questions, right? One question is, how do we leverage what we own in common? All of that public realm, that streets and sidewalks, that's parks, that's libraries, all of that we own together as a public, that is our civic commons. How do we leverage that to do more in service of what people need and want? And then in pushing that a little bit further, thinking about the notion of, you know, that kind of work happens at a very granular level in a very tactical way. So, how do you connect that work that's happening at the level of the block, that one foot level, with the systemic change that we want to make, right? The systems change that we're thinking about. So how do you go from the block to the city limits? Uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And so I thought that I would share with you sort of my building blocks. That is, what are foundational principles for me in the work that I've been doing uh, and how we sort of move the, the needle on some of these public policy questions we care so much about when we're often working at the scale of the block. So uh, you heard uh, quite a bit about our Department of Transportation. You know, I always tell people, uh, and it's not my phrase, but when you, when you communicate with folks, you wanna meet people where they are. So we're all here on Zoom. Uh, we're in a snowstorm here in Chicago, and I'll tell you where I'm at, uh, which is at the Chicago Department of Transportation, which you heard a little bit about. And it's really, you know, the tabletop of the city of Chicago. Um, you know, it's the kind of place where we function from policy to potholes, and you have to care about both, and you have to be able to move back and forth between the two things. So whether that is our bike share program, that is uh, the largest by geography in the country, uh, to our, our bridges and our viaducts and all of our infrastructure, to the services that we provide, and the idea of getting people from where they are to those meaningful destinations in their life, it's, it's all of these pieces. Um, and so it's something that, you know, when we think about that idea of leverage, when you start with the Department of Transportation, you can see how much you have to work with. And, you know, cities, you know, we all know 30 to 50 percent of a city is public realm. It's something that we all own in common. And most of it is streets. And you can see in some of these stats, you know, not only 150 square miles of bike share, 26 miles of boulevards that are connected to 1,700 acres of open space, but we're responsible for your lights, your alleys, your sidewalks, all of these things that have everything to do with how you perceive value in your neighborhood, what your quality of life is like, all of those pieces together are part of what CDOT does. But what does that look like across a set of buckets? Um, you know, if I were to put them in really four, three or four categories here, I'd say so the first is about mobility and transit. And that is that fundamental role that we have to play in, as I mentioned earlier, getting people from where they are to that meaningful destination, like school, like jobs, like shopping, the places they wanna go. And we've been doing that 
um, at, at a number of different levels, particularly working hand in glove with our Department of Transportation, where we've done pop-up bus lanes, for example, during the pandemic that connects 20,000 essential workers to their places of work um, in a way that can be socially distanced. If you create the bus lanes, you reduce the friction, you're allowed to, you can run more of these operations. It's small work, but it's critical in connecting people across that network. I talked about our bike share system, and during COVID, we expanded that 50 miles across our city limits. And so we got to that 150 miles by actually adding it all to the south side of our city, um, to the city limits, to really connect that whole network and make it a viable opportunity for transportation use. And then, you know, to the uh, the photo on the right is all about walkability. That if we think about what we have and what we can leverage, how do we create walkable neighborhoods? How do we invest in ways that make it safe and easy? and simple uh, for people to be present in their communities, to be on the public way, to move at that non-motorized, uh, in that non-motorized fashion, and how do we think about the most vulnerable populations across those modalities? So that's one bucket. Another, which I think is probably of a lot of interest uh, to this group, is planning, designing, and engineering. And so, you know, we're responsible for figuring out how do we create, and not one of our goals, which is the most connected bike network in the country, that it's not bike, Infrastructure should not just be measured in mileage, but it should be measured in terms of the relief for mobility hardship. And then we also do the very fine tuning uh, engineering work and working on the geometry of our streets. That's also part of our responsibility in the city. But critically, and this is very important as you're thinking about your career, it's uh, as you're a planner or designer, but you also need to be connected to maintainers. And that's another piece of what we do where we see the consequences of our policy decisions and our infrastructure choices, but we're responsible for reforestation of our city in our public way. How do you reduce the urban heat island by connecting the network of forestry that happens across our city? That's something we do. And maintaining those bridge and viaduct structures where we have, you know, 40 of our 300 bridges are all movable operator, operable 100-year-old bridges that open and close 20,000 times a year. And then down to that granular level, um, maintaining that sign, we fabricate the signs, we install the signs, all of these things as you think about the world around you in a city we're touching, we have touch points with your whole experience outside of your front door. And the last big bucket that became, I think, uh, very palpable and kind of writ large during COVID is this activation and management component of the work that we do. Um, whether it was, you can see in the center under um, our outdoor dining program, which was saying, okay, our streets do any number of things that are all about movement. How do we actually put our streets in service of an economic need for our restaurant community and the cascade of services and supply chains and workers that really depend on it? And so that meant turning over curb lanes and alleys and sidewalks and full streets and vacant lots and even private parking lots that we ended up co-managing in this process um, and really trying to be nimble in the moment of crisis to make a different kind of use possible out of our streets, as well with our shared streets program. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you know, a lot of cities had programs where you quickly close down streets, uh, reduce vehicle traffic, and then make it as easy as possible for people to walk and bike and recreate and be socially distanced. We did that too, uh, but we did it a lot slower uh, in part because we needed to build trust and the speed of trust is slow. And I like to say slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, and we did our shared streets program by doing public outreach first rather than running in to do what we thought might have been the right thing to do. And it made all the difference. Um, and we purposely called it shared streets to really make emphatic this idea that, well, we may manage the streets as a city and you may live on that street, but you have neighbors and we all have a stake in what happens to that street. So it is fundamentally shared. And then last part of our role was also to help codify the expressions of response to the murder of George Floyd the dialogue about police brutality and structural racism that in our city and in every city, um, part of our role was to enable people to give voice to that. And so you can see on the left working uh, with artists and communities to create a space for that expression to occur on the street. So we, I'm talking about some very tactical things, right? I'm talking about how we operate day to day and the things that we can do with the tools that we have. But if we zoom back out, right, to that 30,000 foot level and think about our city, we have to begin to think about how these everyday acts have a connection to moving the needle on these big public policy questions. And as we're working on problems that are, they're wicked problems, they're adaptive challenges, 
um, how do we connect the dots between that work we might do as a planner, as a designer, as a maintainer in that regard? So I, what I have on the screen here is this is, these, this is the same city. This is Chicago, 50 years apart. And this is an income map of our city. And you can see uh, in the dark orange is where you have very low income. And in dark blue, is you have very high income. And then the kind of off-white color is middle income. And you can see over the last 50 years between 1970 and today, the dramatic differences. You have the disappearance of the middle income strata. You have the spatialization of poverty across our city that also tracks with where our, most of our black and brown communities are concentrated. You have this, uh, this concentration of wealth on the north and east side of our city. And so the segregation that you hear about in Chicago is writ large also in the economic conditions that you see um, in our city. And so I put this map here in part because our mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, has tasked her entire cabinet and, her, and the whole city and organizations, public and private within it, to say, how do we end generational poverty in this city? And, you know, you think as a transportation director, well, what do I have to do with that if I'm talking about street signs and bike lanes and all that? But we have a role to play. And the challenge here is how can we move back and forth between these big adaptive challenges when we're used to technical ones? And I want to explain what I mean there. Um, an adaptive challenge is something like uh, what I'm just talking about in terms of poverty or climate change. It's complex. You can't move it in a day. But we're used to solving things like a Rubik's Cube. I'll say, I'll use that. Hopefully, uh, folks recognize uh, this. I'm not dating myself, but it was a very popular toy in the 1980s. Still is popular today, but it's a technical challenge, right? We know how to solve it, right? It comes with instructions where uh, we can follow 85 steps and solve it, or we can do what my kids do, which is they smash it with a hammer and put it back together. But we all know what it looks like when it's solved. There's a set of instructions that you can follow. There are a series of, let's say, best practices you could use to arrive at that Rubik's Cube, to arrive at that solution. And there's a danger in applying this way of thinking to adaptive challenges, and particularly in design and engineering in these fields. Uh, we love a technical challenge because it's discernible, and we think we have the tools and all of these best practices to apply to it. But when you're working on these adaptive challenges, you have to begin to think about, and I have to remind myself, to think about that it's a different set of questions that you're asking. It's a different set of outcomes, a different set of measures, time scales, all of that, and that you need to think differently about both the scale that you're thinking about the problem at, as well as the expertise that you have in the room to work on it. So I'm gonna talk about two types of scales that I've been thinking a lot about, and that's uh, scales of place and scales of expertise. So. Uh, I'll go back in time to, to the period when I was at a Studio Gang Architects, an incredible place, and I started and led the practice of urbanism and civic impact there, which is really looking at how do you contextualize, contextualize the architectural scale of projects, which is like the scale of the body, the scale of the doorknob, uh, with the scale of the city and civitas, the collection of all of us that influence that architectural moment and that architectural moment is influencing out and toggling back and forth across those scales. So some of the work that we were doing, uh, we spent a lot of time in Memphis. And what you're looking at is the Mississippi River, this big elbow where it touches Memphis. Uh, you can see the city is, is uh, sprawling out to the east there off of those radial lines. And uh, this is really, you're looking, at the, you're looking at the city, you're looking at the point and the place and the reason uh, why it was founded where it was. You're also looking at a huge ecosystem, right? Um, and in the Mississippi River ecology that we know stretches you know, from how well north of here to well south of here, um, but that uh, you know, we think about it, particularly in these regional moments as this ecosystem and, and whole ecology. But the charge that we had at Studio Gang was to come in and look at six miles of Mississippi River waterfront, um, really from the top of the image all the way down to the crook of the elbow and to say, how do we help this riverfront, which is a series of disconnected uh, parklands and flooded areas, to be meaningful again to people in Memphis? At this point in the river, it's fast, it's furious, goods and services flow. If you jumped in to swim, you'd end up in New Orleans in like two minutes. So it doesn't play that role that you would imagine a sort of a bucolic river setting might. And so the importance here was to remember that even though it is this whole system, 
that's six miles along it, it's full of these disparate spaces, right? And it has these incredible changes in, in, um, in water levels and heights during flood seasons and not. It fluctuates about 57 feet a year. Uh, Memphis is a bluff city for a reason and built up. But in order to take on a system that big, six miles of it, we then had to sort of break it down into these smaller groupings to really begin to understand how each of those segments experiences its relationship with the river and the city differently. And then how do you position such a linear landscape um, that's along this furthest edge of a city and position it to welcome people back to the riverfront, to connect with uh, people in neighborhoods very far from this space? And so part of the challenge here was, one, how do we break that down? But then, and how do we take that scale from that broad sense and go very deep? And so when you're looking at these landscapes, they're dramatically different. And it causes us, causes us to think about just the materiality at these different scales of, this, of the city. And so looking at this landscape here, which is a view north right along that edge, and yes, that is a pyramid in the background, but it's actually a Bass Pro Shop. Uh, but looking at Tom Lee Park, which is one of these sections, it's flat, it's highly engineered, has a highly engineered edge. And so it has people in the park and people uh, interacting with the park have a very different experience than folks on a northernmost edge that, in fact, when there are flood events, you can actually canoe through the park. So you think about these broad set of landscapes once you start to break down the scale of that big system and then begin to understand that even down to the level of a cobblestone landing, which there are six football fields long of this cobblestone landing, um, that is really at that exact transom point where ships and boats would bring goods to Memphis. And importantly, this is the exact spot where the fortunes of so many Memphians were made through the cotton industry. And the cotton industry built on the backs of enslaved people is a marker for, these stones are a marker for that. And yet they're blank and yet they're here. How do you think about what you would do in this place uh, so charged with that history. As well, when we start to bring in different kinds of expertise, let's say, to some of these questions, as we start to scale down to the material, to the, to the level of the stone, as folks who are in these fields, we think, okay, well, let's, let's get, bring in experts and we think, let's understand the geology, right, of those stones if we're going to think about them differently. And there are nine types of limestone that are there. I mean, we might think, well, maybe these could be building blocks for uh, repositioning and resetting uh, th this landing and so people could then interact with the water and all kinds of things. But what's important here is that to understand the whole system, the whole ecosystem and the whole project in that space, that you need to understand the stone, that individual stone. And to understand that stone, you actually have to invite others to offer up meaning of those stones to understand how you might transfigure that into something that you can't imagine. That while I think as a planner and a designer, we're often in places where we get to walk around with that title and that moniker. Um, but the fact is that some of the best work, some of the most meaningful work comes from engaging folks who have the lived local experience, who are close to the objects that you're staring at, who can provide a totally different sense of what they mean. And this leads to that transfiguration with a totally different outcome. And so what you're looking at here are the images of the cobblestone landing. And then in the middle, these are people in Memphis who make change in their community, make that civic impact at very different scales. From Elmore Nickelberry, who marched with Dr. King in the streets and sanitation strike right before he was assassinated, who still works for the streets and sanitation department to you know, uh, Mayor Strickland, who thinks about the whole city at that scale and, and folks in between, and to ask them, what, I what is the meaning that you see in these stones? And then out of that dialogue, then transforming those stones in response to that. So these stones were eventually part of an exhibit in the Venice Biennale, um, where we were connecting the dots across the scales from the body to really the planetary universe as part of the US exhibition. But my point here is that we need to invite people into the room to get meaningful outcomes that are better reflective and not only reflective that are meaningful um, in the place to the folks who live with the design ideas and conversation and process that so often we're engaged in. So 
I want to talk from there about scales of expertise, and you can probably see where I'm going. This is a, a, a cartoon of a park I was involved with uh, for a couple of years um, in, when I was wearing my park hat uh, working in Chicago and in other places um, in the country and the world. So this park, uh, a couple hundred acres, has amazing amenities in it. Um, and on one side of the park, you had high densities of children living in and around the park on the north side. And on the south side, you had community centers and pools and uh, artificial turf athletic fields and all the bells and whistles. And as you can imagine, children on the north side of the park were not coming to use the south side of the park facilities. And we were experiencing low enrollment in that park, even though it's, a, it's an absolute treasure with all the kinds of things that should attract folks to parks, especially young people. And we know it's hypercritical that we build those connections in programming, uh, because at least in Chicago, what we knew and what we continue to know is that if someone participates in a park program for two seasons in a row, winter, spring, let's say, if they, uh, if they participate in a couple of seasons in a row, they tend to stick. But if they disappear from the after school program, from the baseball team, from, you know, whatever swimming program, if they disappear for two seasons in a row, that kid is usually not coming back. So there's a stickiness that we need to have when kids enter our program to keep them um, engaged and, and participating in the after school programs that make such a difference in their lives. So it matters. My point is it mattered that we had kids on one side of the park not participating. And so, of course, as a planner, you think, well, why? Why is this not happening? And you take one look at this drawing, and you think, well, it's a street. It's got to be the street, right? And it is a major arterial, and it's very hard to cross. And it could use a ton of uh, crosswalks and pedestrian calming and all kinds of pedestrian calming, vehicle calming, uh, pedestrian crossing. Um, and that seems like that, that would be a solution, right? But the fact is, the more time we spent and the more we listened and the less we talked, uh, what we learned was that, yeah, sure, it was a street, but that the street was, in fact, a gang line, that there was an invisible barrier that we couldn't see, even though it's our own city, even though it's a neighborhood we've worked for, in for a very long time. But we couldn't see it until we built enough trust with folks who had that local lived experience around that park who felt comfortable sharing that with us. And then we recognize this as a different kind of challenge, a different kind of problem, and that it would take a different set of ideas and people at the table to take that on. I, so I point that out to say that it's very easy to look at the physicality, but we have to connect the dots to the local lived experience of people in neighborhoods to really understand um, what ought to be done. And sometimes we're not the ones to be doing it as city planners and designers and all that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of where that stakeholder engagement fits in. And this is not my diagram, but it is one that I, use as a touchstone uh, in my own work to begin to think about power when it comes to uh, the public realm and how we engage people in it. So very often, we're talking with folks in that upper right quadrant, right? Those are people with high power and a high stake. So that could be the, that could be the mayor, that could be a council person, that could be a head of a community-based organization that's very present and is active and is able to influence change. But we are not far too often not talking with folks in the lower right quadrant. And so those are folks with a high stake, but they have low power, that they are not able to influence the decisions that are made. Those are the folks that we need to look around for, that we need to make an extra effort to make sure they're at the table. Because that kind of information, that is experience that's as good as anything any planner will bring into the room. And so the key is to figure out how to tap into that, how to build trust, and how to get folks in the conversation. So as you're evaluating your stakeholder participation, it's important, at least from my perspective, to say, well, who is not in the room? As they say, and I, I, didn't, I didn't make it up, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. So it's very important that we have a big table and lots of chairs, but it's also important to not only have people at the table, but to look at places where we can hand decision-making over to people who've been most marginalized from the conversation. You know, some of the work that we've been doing in Chicago is around this initiative called Vision Zero. And what this is about is it works under the assumption that every death from traffic, every major injury from a traffic crash is preventable. And so one of the things that we do is an intense amount of outreach and conversation and engagement to understand what safety looks like. And that, of course, has to mean broadening that conversation 
that in our city, safety means different things from block to block. It's not just about cars. It's about all kinds of things. But what's really important is that we get folks like these kids here who fall into that lower right quadrant. They have low power, but they have a very high stake in the quality of their neighborhood, in the safety of their community, and being able to walk or to ride their bike and move around. And what they observe from their perspective is critical expertise that we don't have, that we need to make sure is not just part of a checklist uh, and making sure that we've talked with folks, but to make sure that this is part of an ongoing dialogue so we can build a relationship that's not just project specific. This is the opportunity, but how we nurture and maintain those relationships for the long haul will make the work more effective because the information is going to be better because the capacity building that's happening on both sides and the reciprocity of us delivering on things that people decide are the right decisions, that all is very meaningful and will help us to move the needle on those big questions. And the way that that manifests, right? So you have, you can, you can connect the dots from this all the way up to that 30,000 foot level. And this is in that same neighborhood where the uh, kids were giving us information and feedback and their expertise. Um, this is the map that we use to really understand what to do next. So, and it really, you have to think about these levels. So where we typically start, well, we have in purple, those high crash corridors, right? And we have in the heat map in the red, um, that's where the serious fatalities and serious injuries took place in the couple of years prior. And so you could stop there. Um, and as a player, you know, uh, as, as traffic engineers often do say, well, we have the data and this is what it says. And so we know where to go with our projects. But pushing that down another level, the observed dangerous driving behaviors, working together with communities to do that observational work, that's how we get those blue teardrops um, that are scattered across the map. And so now we're starting to get a little more information that's more granular, but that's connected to that bigger question. And then critically, in white, uh, the little white dots are residents' priority recommendations. So what you're looking at are these points of convergence, right, um, where we can say, okay, we can really invest here because it's not only as a process, but also as the kind of data that's coming in, we can see this confluence of observation and experience and data together. That's when we know, okay, that is the right place. That's a project that's going to be meaningful across all of these levels, and it can cascade up to a much bigger picture. But the key here, too, though, is that, yes, we need to scale this, right? How do we get up to that systemic viewpoint? Uh, part of that challenge is to make sure that you do the work, and that is the hard part. And that's on city officials often, where you have to do the work to not assume that what you have observed and experienced in this particular set of neighborhoods, in this process, that you've come up with the best practices that can work anywhere. Um, I have an aversion to best practices. Uh, I prefer best principles, right? The values travel, the, the, the way that you engage can travel, uh, but the practices might be different. It's best principles and good practices because what, what we do in Chicago in a neighborhood isn't necessarily going to work uh, for a neighborhood in your city. And so it's important that we remember um, that while our values uh, can travel with us, our practices don't have to. We need to be flexible in that regard, but you have to do the work to be able to connect that whole chain from the block to the city limits. And one of the ways that uh, this manifested was during COVID for us, I mentioned a little bit earlier, our shared streets program. Um, and I mentioned, you know, you saw cities like Oakland who unveiled like dozens and dozens of miles of uh, protected or uh, enclosed streets. Um, the city of Paris, they're doing that whole other thing that's built on a longer conversation uh, than has been had here in Chicago. Um, but the, what we recognize is we hadn't done the work to build enough trust that, and to have enough feedback that we could just do that by fiat. Perhaps so there are some things one should do by fiat, but if you can avoid it, do so and engage folks in the dialogue. So the question that we first asked Chicagoans was not, do you want us to close your street? It was, what are you experiencing? What would you like to see happen? Rather than create a tight frame initially that would get us like as if it was that technical problem, we asked a much more open-ended questions. We got thousands of responses um, and, and thousands of letters and emails and survey responses. And that actually helped us to get a much more nuanced picture of what people would have liked to see happen. And then we could say, here are the things that we're able to do. 
let's experiment. And we did community meetings by Zoom or in person in a socially distanced way. And we were getting, I was getting, you know, uh, uh, certainly a lot of pressure from the advocacy community that cares a lot about do, putting in uh, these kinds of things. Um, but our goal was to really take the time to listen well and to respond in different ways. So, for example, not everybody wanted to have their street closed. Um, many folks said, you know what, why don't you guys just get your construction work done and get my street put back? Or, you know what, we drive here and we need to get to our jobs and this feels like you're taking something away. You're taking our street away because you want to do this bike thing. Um, those are all conversations that are much deeper that we would need to work on together um, rather than just say, well, here's what we're doing. And so then when we did put in the shared streets, what we were able to do was lay some, some foundations for a much longer conversation about where we want to go as a city and as a transportation department, how we would like to see uh, the possibilities that were manifest in the shared streets program become permanent, that we want to be able to have streets accessible for dining, for cycling, for all of these things that speak more to what people need to see on their block. Um, but you can only do that through that slow process of trust building and of being responsive. There are many, many projects that I could have identified that I might have wanted to do, but what was more important was setting up a process and a dialogue and being willing to be flexible um, in that regard. So I just wanted to circle back on what I think some of these building blocks are as I've sort of walked you through this kind of range of experiences. And I know we're going to have a, a great uh, question and answer session, so I'm happy to get into it and, and uh, talk about more projects and other things. But to really put a, a finer point on it, you know, the first kind of building block is to use the right tool for the job. Know what you're looking at. Is this an adaptive challenge? Is this a technical one? Bring the right tools. Bring the right frame of mind. Think about process. How you do things is as important, if not more so, than any outcomes that you end up with. And so, Bring, think, be thinking about that um, and know that those adaptive challenges that I'm talking about, they require different tools. They require different time frames. All of these other nuances that quickly solving a math problem uh, doesn't have to worry about. Um, so be thinking about that idea of the right tool for the job, thinking about the problem that you're looking to help find a solution for. The second is know your place. <laughs> There's a double entendre in that, but you know, know your place in terms of one, really understand it, the whole materiality at many different scales, right? Understanding that whole ecosystem as much as you can of the Mississippi River along Memphis, and then understanding how it breaks down and that materiality at that stone scale, right? Understanding it from the stone to the city limits. Um, that's how you'll begin to really unpack uh, what could be meaningful in the design intervention or the planning idea that, you're, that you'd like to move forward. But in that, right, it's also know your place, that uh, know that it, coming in from the outside, even in your own city, you can be a stranger on the block. And so creating space for others, for people with that local lived experience. And I, I've been saying that phrase over and over, and um, you know, it really is linked to the idea of metis um, in, the, in the book, Seeing as a State, you know, and thinking about that you know, who knows their block better than you, right? It's probably Mrs. Jones who lives on it, who sits on her front porch, who's watching it every day. She's got information that you will never have, that I will never have about a street in Chicago. And the challenge is to create room and to know that you don't have, you don't know her, her level of experiences and you've got to figure out how to get that into the room. And that will help you to know that place a little bit more than you do. And then these are just good rules to live by. But I find that in this process of working on toggling back and forth between the scale of the stone and the scale of the city limits is this continual process. You have to of listening, learning, practicing, and reflecting. And repeat. It's like a rinse and repeat. Um, and, you know, and, and really understanding that the whole, in my experience, in trying to create change in cities at whatever scale, that it's always iterative. It's always full of missteps and mistakes and human beings. And we all uh, need to be willing to be corrected, be willing to learn, be willing to do better, to reflect and to go back and to keep listening. And you really, you'll find that if, 
you lean into these really simple ideas, um, you'll be able to move work forward in a way that builds that longer term relationship that enables whatever changes do occur to be, to have that meaning and to be beloved um, and to make that really longitudinal change. I think in a corollary to this is just the idea that, you know, in the work of urbanism, there's always someone coming after, right? That's one reason to make sure you've got lots of folks at the table because of the cycling through. Um, but we know that what you do today will be different than what someone will do tomorrow. So how do you set in the parameters of process and of relationship building so that way there's an adaptation that is connected to the work that has come prior? And now just to finally put a fine point on, on this diagram, um, again, I think it's adapted and there's a source at the bottom that you can grab. But I think the other piece of this is that what are we trying to do with this diagram? And I mentioned earlier, it's those pink dots in the lower right, how do you get them into that quadrant? That's part of that question. The other in the bottom left, those are folks with low power and who feel they have a low stake. And the key here, when you're thinking about stakeholder engagement, is who are folks who don't think they have a stake in this and feel disaffected, right? that feel that what's happening in the neighborhood that's a mile away has nothing to do with them. You have to challenge yourself with the idea that you are trying to build together some, some sinew, some connection across your city between people. And as much as you're working to build relationships with folks on that project basis, but how do you leverage all of the relationships you have in other parts of your city to bring folks who feel disaffected, to be engaged, to feel they have a stake in the outcome? That's how we can get more momentum, more muscle behind moving toward positive change. And some of those folks in the upper right, maybe they wanna step back over to the, uh, the top left um, where they may have power, but they maybe need to not be so influential in that conversation. Just being there because you have power isn't enough um, to make for great urbanism, great civic impact. So uh, finally, you know, this is what, <laughs> this is the, the meat and the construct of what I have to think about every day. Um, and it's, it's not just an intersection, right? But metaphorically so too, as we think about how all of these pieces, uh, whether it's of our public realm, whether it's of our mobility network, whether it's of the pieces and parts that help us move toward positive change and adaptive challenge, that there are all of these actors. Um, and in transportation's case, we often think about who is the most vulnerable in that confluence of issues at that intersection, right? It's the pedestrian. It's the person who's not in a car or not on a bus. And if we think about folks who are either the most vulnerable or most marginalized uh, in our conversations at the intersections of what we do, and we plan for folks who are the most vulnerable, uh, or not, plan not for but with, when you think about folks who are on the outside of those questions and plan with them, you end up with solutions that accommodate the whole realm. So I put that out there just at, in your travels, as you're thinking about the work that you do, as the career that you may have, or the work that you're doing now and reflecting on it, that this image to me is a reminder that while we all may be present experiencing the same thing, we are not experiencing it in the same way. You hear a lot today about how we're all in the same boat but we are not, we are experiencing the same storm, but not everybody's in a boat. Some people are clinging to the side. Some people are you know, floating out on a piece of driftwood. And we have to remember that even though it looks like we could just carve up and share the space that there's this notion of equity where we need to do more and differently because for different uh, stakeholders in the system, because we are all experiencing, whether it's COVID or a storm or anything else differently, and it's that mindset that if you bring that to projects, um, you will be able to pull in the kinds of ideas, the knowledge, the know-how, the capacity, and all the things that help us connect the dots between that block and that city limit. So with that, uh, I'll stop talking. Thank you very much. And I, I'm happy to uh, get into a, a discussion. Yeah. I would just like to thank you so much, first of all, for this quite a rigorous uh, discussion that I'm looking forward to having with you and, and the audience as well. And I, I would just say that you can see the passion in what you talk about and your work uh, that, that comes across very, very well. 
and it's contagious. It's very contagious. So thank you so much for, for sharing that aspect of your, of your being, because I, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting intersection that you're sharing with us. But I, I wanna ask something that was not on my mind originally, and it was the word you used of metaphor. So at the, at the end of your talk. So before we open that up for discussion among those who are with us, I'm curious to know what metaphor would you use for the work that you do in Chicago? Well, that is an extremely challenging question. <laughs> Um, wow, that is a very interesting question. Um, I'd have to give that a lot more thought, I think. I mean, I, my, a lot of my touchstones are really um, in that realm of, of, yeah, I guess I touched on a lot. Like I was throwing, it was like metaphor spaghetti I was throwing at everyone, right? But, you know, and I think, I, I like to think in terms of systems and ecosystems, right? And that there is this sort of um, the, how we, how we activate idealism has so much to do with how we understand each other in this ecosystem. And I guess, you know, when I worked at Chiu Gang, we talked a lot about ecological urbanism and then like an architectural urbanism, right? And so I guess um, I'm cycling through lots of analogies here, but I think thinking about the body in the city, right? And, and as connected, I guess, symbols, the body in Civitas. I was really affected by um, the Venice Biennale framing that we were working within, which was the, it was the body, the city, Civitas, the region, the nation state. And then it, it literally got planetary with different architects trying to take on what that means. Um, so I guess I'm always thinking in terms of cascading systems and that you're moving back and forth across them. <laughs> Sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the whole system of transportation because it is tied to other social systems in the city and you've shared that with us. And, and so that, that might include for our audience things like quality jobs, health care, you know, uh, safety bike lanes and storage, quality education, affordable housing, and of course quality food systems. So I'm curious that if someone says, because you, you mentioned this, that it isn't my problem and it's not a problem to them, uh, how do you begin to help your staff and, and all the personnel that you have uh, understand the different perspectives and how to balance and collaborate with those other departments who might not think it's not my problem, it's, housing is someone else's problem. How do you show them how there's an intrinsic relationship? No, that's a, that's a great question. You know, one of the things we've been working on in Chicago is a plan for equitable transit-oriented development, ETOD. And we have a whole network of folks across departments that are part of this multi-departmental initiative where we each have to offer up, okay, what is, we have to define what is the role that we play with equitable transit-oriented development. And I have to sit alongside housing, I sit alongside the Department of Public Health, who sits alongside, you know, the Department of Planning, and we ha we actually have this framework. And I think that's key, right? For planners, you put plans and you make plans, you put them on a shelf and they, they look beautiful on that shelf. But those, when you activate those frameworks and have a project um, that forces that collaboration, it bears out the possibility. And so, uh, to you know, an example, uh, for example, anything that you, one, if you can throw uh, put a budget towards something, you can definitely get departments to take notice, right? Um, the other thing that we've been doing here in Chicago is, uh, at least in the Department of Transportation, is during COVID, we undertook a strategic planning process. Um, so we brought in uh, Bloomberg Associates, uh, who's been helping guide us through this. We spent the last nine months um, doing strategic planning. And you think, what, in a pandemic, who would do that? Why you should just, just be pandemic focused? But for me, it was, if we don't talk about the future, there isn't one. And so we need to begin to talk about what kind of future we want to be a part of. And the mayor has set the tone on issues of racial justice and equity. And so my job is to say, well, what does mobility justice look like? What does economic hardship have to do with the work that we do? And so those were the hallmarks of our internal strategic planning process, where we created working groups 
that we're taking on these kinds of questions. And so the idea here is that it's the staff and the rank and file that are determining what our strategic goals are around some of these uh, rubrics that we've asked folks to take on. The other thing that was really important, and, and I think this is getting at like hearts and minds, right? Uh, we know that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, like every day. And so we, gotta, we have to think about how we change culture while we're talking about strategy. Uh, but one of the things that we did was we helped fund the Transportation Equity Network. And these are all the advocacy groups that get mad at us a lot, that have really great criticism. Uh, occasionally, I'm like, come on, you know, we're trying. But they're a really great group of, that needed, uh, of advocates that needed a platform. So we helped fund uh, getting them organized to be a critique and in-house critiquing our strategic plan. So the whole way we had unvarnished criticism from outside groups um, to help define the goals. So what they did was they gave us equity challenges. So they said, okay, you guys have goals around this. Our equity challenge is, for example, how are you gonna reduce all forms of violence on streets, not just traffic violence, which is something that we're pivoting toward, right? We need to reinvest in communities with all these other tools we have for great place making that stimulate economic vitality. We need to create jobs. We have programs that do that. Um, and so part of it too was, was letting your critics in the room, uh, sometimes without us in the room, so they could say in an unvarnished way to, uh, uh, our, uh, to a third party, here are the kinds of things that CDOT needs to do. So we are publishing that plan in a couple of weeks um, and it will have verbatim what our, what our biggest critics think we ought to be working on. And then we've got, here are the goals that we think get us there. Um, they're literally reviewing the plan before we publish it. So we're making sure. So it keeps us honest, we publish it. And so it's built by both folks inside CDOT, right, toward defining the goals. It's also built by folks who hold us accountable and then it's published for the world to see. And so that's one way of, you know, whether I'm here or not, we made it, we're gonna make it very clear about what we care about and those pillars of economic justice, uh, climate justice, mobility justice, all of those pieces are written in ink. Oh, excellent. That was a long answer, sorry. Oh, oh uh, I wanna make sure that we get some of the individuals who are leaving information in the chat. And Nicole said, have you seen the public's receptivity to your projects change with COVID-19? You started to mention a little bit about that and she asked in what ways? Yeah, I, it's a great question. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, these opportunities where the public could just raise their hand and say, hey, myself and a group of neighbors were interested in possibly doing a shared street. Um, people learn that they can have agency, they can help decide what happens in their community. That was, that's planting the seeds, right, for how, how we move forward together. And the attitudes we did change. We had some shared street areas, for example, um, where you know, there was mixed feelings about it. We did it as a pilot project and the folks loved it and begged us to keep it and kept renewing it through the end of the year. I think, though, oddly enough, the outdoor dining, I think will have been the most transformative in changing Chicagoans' oh minds. We love, we love to eat Chicago. We love to eat outside. Um, but closing down streets and putting up tables and people eating, I mean, I've had more folks who were huge obstacles to the concept of turning streets into piazzas or into permanent pedestrian areas who are now asking for it. Who are saying, how do we help our commercial areas of the city recover? What can we do from an infrastructure perspective? What can we do from a programming perspective to invite people back? I think a lot of cities are, I, I know we are, we're concerned about, you know, some of our, whether it's downtown or in neighborhoods that have been retail centers, what happens? Well, you have to create a set of experiences, a reason for people to go, a reason for people to gather, COVID safe. That dialogue, I'm having that dialogue in places where it was a non-starter um, a year ago. So I think it's really exciting, right? It just took like, I don't know, some tables and chairs and some food. <laughs> and people could say, oh, maybe my, my whole street doesn't need to have cars all the time. Maybe we don't need parking. I have another, I have another <laughs> question from Abigail and she wants to know, how do you carve out a compromise when different stakeholders in your community want very different things? No, that's a hard one. I think part of, um, you know, when I was talking about the Vision Zero plan, I, I talked about like points of convergence. Um, and that is something that, um, you know, we're often looking for like, what are the three options? You vote on one of three and 
two thirds of the room is mad and one third gets what they want. And if everybody's mad, everybody would probably buy. Um, that is a way of doing it. But what's more interesting is to begin to you go from that options to versions that are causing the ideas across these to converge, collide in your plan. So you're not voting up or down a, a plan, but you're saying here's something where it's reflecting all of a number of these options. It's re, people can recognize something they cared about, maybe not everything, but that there's something discernible that folks uh, thought would be a meaningful change. Uh, but you know, it, it is hard. Sometimes also what can be helpful is to do something on a trial basis. Um, that goes a long way. Now I have to say, I have a, I have a problem with tactical urbanism. Uh, in many ways where uh, we need to be asking ourselves if you're going to turn a parking space into a park for a day, um, who decides? Who decided that was yours to do? And we've seen lots of movements in cities uh, of well-meaning groups who go into other neighborhoods and say, I'm going to turn your parking into a park for the day. Um, and so that can provide that um, friction. That said, there is a role, I think, for experimentation and pop-up um, and allowing folks to have a hand in that. Uh, there are groups like like a Better Block Foundation that's really good at this kind of thing, where they'll spend a lot of time talking and thinking and listening, try something out, take it away. And I think that was the other thing with a shared street. When people were done with it, they're like, get that out of there. Okay, we're not going to force it down your throats. But now we know when we come back to talk about that permanent, permanent greenway, um, we have something to work with in terms of the set of experiences. We shared an experience. So that can make a difference. Okay. Uh before I, I ask this question from, from Justin, I, I want to clarify, because I, I think this is a, an interesting thing. There is a difference between uh, what we have a tendency to think of as community engagement and outreach. And one uh, at least observes, but does not respond directly to those individuals whom you, you call individuals who are not heard in the process, but should be included in the process. So Justin asked a question, how do you stay on track when engaging with communities, emotion guided the direction of a project? How, how do you do that? Well, I think one, you might have to put away your track, right? I, I talked at the beginning, like you meet people where they are. When we work on, for example, pedestrian safety projects, um, we can't start our conversation in some neighborhoods, we can't start it with, well, we want to put in some traffic calming because folks are experiencing violence on their streets. It's a, it's a serious issue, it's real. And if we try to bulldoze through a conversation about that we want to get to, then we've done everything to break trust um, before we even got to what we were hoping to talk about. So part of it is being willing to expand timelines. I know that's hard, especially when you have grant sources and those kinds of things. Um, it's also to break down the scale, a scale, I'm constantly talking about it, but break down the scale of the interactions. That um, it doesn't always, a big public meeting, you need to really evaluate what you're trying to do with that. Um, and that one-on-one -on -one conversations, they're labor intensive, but they make all the difference in understanding people's story. Um, I used to teach a, a workshop at Studio Gang that was how to talk to someone. How do you interview someone? How do you listen well? How do you, in Chicago at least, you can't talk about community engagement until you understand the history of community organizing in Chicago and where that started. And when people are coming to the table with decades, even a hundred years of experience uh, of, through their family and others, that that's coming to the table when you meet them. But I do, I love this question because I often think there's, there's a community engagement continuum which um, is probably familiar to some folks. So at one end, you have inform. We're just telling people what's going to happen. The other end, you have empower. We're actually handing over decision-making to communities and stakeholders. And in between, you've got collaboration and other kinds of things that are variations in between. Now, I'd say that one end is not necessarily better than the other, right? It's being honest about where you are in that, on that continuum with the people you're working with. Most people will... If you, if you are clear and say, we are just saying what's going to happen, it's not great, you know, or we got to this point, but we need to be honest about where we are and what's possible in this conversation. Too often, we're in conversations where we plan to just tell, but we act like people are actually empowered to make decisions. 
I think the key is to know where you are, to be clear about that with folks that you're working with, and to look for every opportunity to mix it up. You don't need a community meeting to pick paint colors. Maybe you do, but most times you don't. But on other topics, you could hand over some decision. Maybe you do hand over paint colors and something else. And so it's hard building that flexibility, but I think being clear about where you are can also help with if you have a timeline you're working with. Um, if you're honest about it, you say, this is the point where we can do this, we're not able to do that. Um, if you've built trust over other things before you get to that point, that will actually be more effective. And so that's something to think about too, that your relationship is, that, is longitudinal. If it's just project-based and you walk away and you're never talking to that neighborhood again until you need something from them, that's not going to be very helpful either way. And the last point is reciprocity. A slice of pizza is great, but it is not enough to pay someone for their intellectual capital. So yes, you should always have food at meetings. But what we've done with you know, that transportation equity network, we paid them to participate because their knowledge has value. When I worked in Memphis, we launched a youth design leadership program where we paid the kids to do work, real work, high school kids, uh, and it was valuable and information. There's no way anyone would have told us what they told the kids about what we should be doing in Mississippi River. We paid them to do it. Um, and so I just encourage you anytime you can, it's not always easy when you work for the city, but if you pay people to participate, um, it makes all the difference. That, that reciprocity um, is really important if you can do it. And I'm going to follow up with that very quickly before I go to the next one. And that is that there is a difference between cultural and linguistic appropriate ways of making sure you are participatory yourself, making that connection and relying on your local leadership to be able to do the same thing. So how do you uh, brush up and prove your linguistic understanding because you're dealing with a very diverse population who have different perceptions of transportation. You've mentioned some of them. So how do you really talk to those, those different groups, cohorts, in a language that they then uh, can understand? Yeah, wherever possible, hire people from the neighborhood to be part of your organization. That, I mean, my goal is to make sure that our department looks like the city of Chicago, reflects our city and our neighborhoods. That's your first, your first best option if you can do it. Um, because there is that, it's that local experience, right? That lived experience. There's a way of communicating um, that is, it's hyper-local and it matters. I think the other piece is to develop relationships if they're, with other organizations that are doing work and to ask them if they're willing to be ambassadors for what you're working on. And sometimes you're not in the room for that. I think that's also important. You know, uh, when I was at Studio Gang, we would do, uh, you know, essentially a meeting in the box where we say, here's the set of questions that we're interested in. And we hope folks are interested in it too. And we're handing them off to a credible local partner who will take it from there and let us know. We did this in a project in New York with uh, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and um, working in Brownsville, uh, in Brooklyn and Morsania in the Bronx on how could you create, um, how could you invest in, in the public realm in that, in that block scale in a way to reduce violence and to create neutral spaces. And so we recognize we're not from neighborhoods there and even having an office in the city doesn't give you any credibility, um, but we work to build some relationships with local organizers and say, we. One, we'll pay you two. Here's what we're interested in. Go have the meetings. And there were these incredible meetings happening uh, without us. And folks came back and said, okay, let us help interpret for you what people were saying. So I think there's also that w willingness to say that, um, that I don't understand, that I can hand over power and agency. And, but it all comes back to you still have to build some relationships out there. Um, and, and building that trust, you know, like I said, it's, it's, the speed of trust is slow and you have to do the work, you have to be accessible um, and you know, do your best and rinse and repeat. <laughs> okay, Brennan, ask a question. He is working on a transportation project himself as a, as a student in planning. And, and he asked, um, as the transportation commissioner at a core of fragmented conglomerates of cities, how do you balance the need of Chicago residents that 
and, and those of uh, suburban commuters? And that was one of the questions I was gonna ask, so. Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, and you look at, even right now, um, you know, you look at the different, uh, the, the CTA, which runs within the city limits and that's buses and trains. And then we have something called PACE, that's a suburban route. Um, the suburbanites are not coming back to the city, at least on public transportation. Uh, and yet they do have a stake when they do come here. Um, but what we try to do, we do try to err on the side of Chicagoans. Um, we have enough, uh, we, have, we have a lot of folks in our city. We want to keep them here. Um, we're not going to ignore some of the suburban needs. So we collaborate. Um, but we have some primary lenses here. And part of it is making sure that our equitable transit-oriented development is erring on the side of Chicagoans that need us the most. So, um, which is not to say we again, would ignore the suburban population, uh, but we have so much work to do here and finite resources to do it. Um, we're happy to collaborate, but uh, we pick and choose where we're gonna put a lot of energy. I think we do a lot of projects um, with transportation, train logistics, um, the CREATE program, which is like a $4 billion investment in, in eliminating uh, grade conflicts between trains running through the city. Um, that's a massive project. It touches coast to coast. Um, we play a role in that, uh, but again, our attentions are really on the communities in Chicago uh, that need us the most. And I do want to take Jacob's question, and, and he, he first of all, just wanted to say what an enjoyable talk, and thank you oh. so much for that. And he is a student who may be seeking some information, but he, he does ask, um, and you might be able to enter it into the chat, but he wanted to know a good place to find some of the presented information from your, uh, for his own research. And he goes further to say, also, what are your methodologies of checking yourself before implementing planning actions in a diverse place like Chicago? Yeah, that's a great, uh, so I'll take the, the, the latter question uh, first. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have lived in Chicago for, gosh, almost 30 years now. Um, and having worked in a, many different places um, and, and in many different ways, I've been able to build up a network of trusted people in every, really every neighborhood in the city. So I do rely on that network to keep me honest and to keep, you know, to make sure that um, they're critiquing me. Um, so there is a little bit of a kitchen cabinet that I do count on. Um, and some of that even goes back to, you know, some of the boards that I sit on, like neighbor space, where that's a community-based management model for open space, a, a quasi-governmental nonprofit, where we're working in areas all over the city, um, meeting folks in that network is very helpful. I also rely quite a bit on um, some of my uh, colleagues nationally who, you know, whether it's on the City Parks Alliance or the National Association of City Transportation Officials, um, to call each other up. But I think toward the local thing, you know, it's been years building relationships and I, and I expect uh, my, my friends and collaborators to call me out if I'm not getting something right and they pick up the phone and, and do that. Uh, it's, it's uncomfortable, but I need it. Um, and then I've got a few other folks, um, particularly who have worked in the fields of um, race, inclusion, diversity, and equity at many different levels that I kind of check things with, but I don't always get it right. And I mess up and I make mistakes and I apologize a lot, um, but I keep coming back and uh, hopefully that, that gains me um, a little bit of something when I do um, trip over and make a mistake. Uh, in terms of the resources, um, certainly anything on uh, the Memphis project, that's on Studio Gang's website. There's a lot of great stuff um, on their website to dig around. Um, I put the sources uh, at the bottom of the deck so maybe we can make that available. Um, I mentioned um, uh, the book Seeing as a State. I think Brett Ryan's uh, Plural Urbanism is really, uh, some, most recently uh, that I read that um, I think it captures pretty well some of the, um, the framing around what happened, you know, how the cascade of work through time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's important to keep, keep reading um, and to keep uh, being willing to be critiqued. So, yep. So try out there for some resources. Uh, you know, there are so, so many groups that do great work, especially around equity. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, put a few ideas in, in the chat or, or send them on afterwards. Okay. 
I'm looking at our time and we do want to stay on time. And so I'm going to wrap up with something that I'd like your comment on. And it says, as planners, we can no longer just go into the community and say, we have a bright idea. And they say, what about this? What about an idea as an oppressed, racialized person? And we just show up and say, I'm sorry, I'm just the housing person. I'm just the transportation person. We have to start realizing that for many of us, we were that intersection of different identities. So there is so no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So can you um, respond to that? I think your talk was saying it, that. Yes. My response snaps <laughs> up. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you, don't, you, know, you don't leave yourself behind when you walk into a room. Why should you expect anyone else to do that? Um, that I think intersectionality is is one of those underpinnings of the work that we do. And and I hope that you're in planning because of that, right? Like that is the what's amazing about it is where those intersections happen. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about, you know, being not just an ally, but being an accomplice by, you know, stepping back and allowing others to lead and to, you know, know your place in that. So I think there's, I think uh, that it's a great statement, and, and I, I agree. <laughs> it's hard to do, but you got to it's, it's the way forward. And thank you so much for that. And I want to, first of all, just thank our audience for being there and viewing. I understand we have several of our alum with us, and I think that our students from the chats that I see that I was not able to mention, some very good uh, comments back, some Thank yous for a great job and awesome lecture. So I do want to give you those feedbacks, but I also want to thank you for your perception of place and expertise and your very enlightening presentation for planners and designers that connect this intrinsic relationship of transportation and urban social systems. So thank you so much, Gia, for being with us. And it was sort of a trying afternoon of not knowing whether we would keep you with us uh, during these rolling power outages or not. And it seems that we've made it through it. So thank you so much for your passion and your enthusiasm about what you do. And what I do hope is that our audience is in fact infectious with what you have told us. So. I do want to say goodbye to everyone on our YouTube channel and with us on um, our uh, Zoom call and uh, hopefully see you again. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.